Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody back again. You've all had your coffee, and uh, there's enough food over there for a holiday dinner, isn't there, hon? <clears throat> but anyway, for those of you out in television again, we just want to thank you for all your cards and letters, for your financial help and all your encouragement, and uh, we just can't put it into words. Again, don't be too concerned about my voice. I had an all-day seminar, and uh, we just overdid it, and so I have a plain old laryngitis, but we were up against it so far as programming, and we had to get this done, if at all possible. So we trust you'll bear with me. By next taping, we should be back to normal. Okay, we're on the but nows and but gods and but whens and so forth, and we're going to jump up now to Romans chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 5, where it says, but to him. But like in every other occasion, we're going to go back and see what brought us up to this but now. And uh, that makes an interesting study, even on your own, as you're reading along through Scripture and you see one of these buts, just stop. Say, now wait a minute. What, what's going ahead of this? What comes in behind it? And you'll have 4,000 Bible studies because I think there's 4,000 and some buts in Scripture. Okay, now this one in Romans chapter 4, of course, Paul is dealing with faith coming out of chapter 3. And one of the primary examples of faith plus nothing was Abraham. I always stop and think that Abraham had nothing going for him except his faith. The law hadn't been given yet. He hadn't been given the right of circumcision. He has come fresh out of idolatry. And all that Abraham did was believed God. All right, Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? In other words, he qualifies that Abraham is his father genetically because Paul is a Jew. <clears throat> now verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory or brag, but never before God, no human being can ever say to God, look what I have done. It just won't work. And even Abraham could never do that. All right, now verse 3. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed, repented, and was baptized. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Doesn't say that. Abraham kept the law. Doesn't say that. Abraham brought sacrifices. Doesn't say that. All it says is, Abraham what? Believed God. Now the other word for believing is faith. Abraham placed his faith in God. Now you remember many, many, many moons ago, I put it on the board, the vast difference between believing God and believing in God. Do you remember those? Doesn't seem like much difference, but it's all the difference in the world and eternity because most of the world believes in God, if not the true God, a false God. But they believe in some God. But you see, when you believe God, then you exercise faith. And that's what we have here. It doesn't say that Abraham believed in God. He knew all about the gods of paganism, but that's not what we're talking about. He believed God. He, by faith, responded to what God said. Now, maybe this is a good time to jump up to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Let's just drop down to verse 13. <clears throat> Romans 10, verse 13. A verse that most everybody knows or has heard of. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then they shall they call on him in whom they have not, what? Believed. So there we start, right out on the basis of faith. How can they call without having faith? All right. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not 
heard, how shall they hear without a preacher? In other words, that's why every believer is to be an ambassador for Christ. That's our job, is to let lost people know what God's Word says. All right, verse 15, how shall they preach or proclaim is a better word, except they be sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that proclaim the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel or God's word. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. Now here's the verse I wanted you to see. So then, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of of God. Now, the way I've always put it is this. God never expects any person in the human race to believe something that he has not spoken. Now, chew on that for a while. You can't believe something that God has not spoken. And he didn't speak all of this in ages past. Now go back with me to Deuteronomy, honey. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Most of you know what it is without even looking it up. But I always have to remember we got new listeners coming in every day. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Now, this isn't my idea. This is what the book says. A lot of people have a hard time swallowing it, but nevertheless, this is what it says. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed have been spoken. They belong unto us and to our children forever. We may be do all the words of the law. All right, but what about the things he hasn't spoken? God doesn't expect anybody to believe that. He can't expect you to believe something that he has not spoken. Now, this whole concept of being saved by faith alone through this death, burial, and resurrection was unknown, totally unknown until it was revealed to this apostle. That's why Paul had to be the extension of everything else. The twelve knew nothing of this gospel, and only what little bit they understood they got from Paul down the road. All right, and so we have to come back to Romans 4, hun. So we have to constantly remember that God does not expect anybody to believe something that he has not revealed through one of his instruments. Now, you know, someone jumped all over me one time by using Paul's words instead of Jesus in the four Gospels. Well, I quickly wrote back, where in the world do you suppose Paul's words come from? Well, they come from Jesus himself. Paul says it directly in the book of Acts, but I heard him say unto me, who? Jesus Christ. All right, in Galatians chapter 1, he makes it so plain that all of Paul's writings came by revelation from the ascended Lord. So don't let anybody ever put you down when you show them Paul's epistles and say, well, that's just one man's opinion. This is the Word of God. Now, let me take you to Peter. I was going to do it sooner or later anyway, so it'll be sooner. Second Peter. And I wrote this just the other day to an inquiring Muslim. And he was wondering where I got the idea that Paul had some kind of authority. Well, I gave him various scripture references, and I said, if that's not enough for you, then look and see what Peter says. Second Peter, chapter 3, 15 and 16. Again, most of you probably know him from memory. We've used them this often. But oh, why can't people get this through their head? Peter is writing by the same inspiration. He is just as much scripture as Paul. But look what Peter says. Verse 15 of 2 Peter 3. Account, understand, that the long suffering, the patience of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved 
brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Now what's he in so many words telling his Jewish readers? If you want salvation, you go to Paul's epistles. He doesn't say go to John's gospel. He doesn't say go back and see what Jesus said. He says, you go to Paul's epistles. All right, then read the next verse. And I think he's making reference to the book of Hebrews, but now in verse 16, as also in all his epistles, Romans through Philemon. And he's speaking of these things. What things? Salvation. How to maintain the Christian life. How to gain eternal life. All right. But even Peter recognizes that in Paul's epistles are some things hard to be understood and which they who are unlearned and unstable twist as they do also the other scriptures. Now what does that word other indicate? That Paul is scripture just as much as Genesis or Matthew or John or anything else. It's all the Word of God. So if anybody ever casts doubt on what Paul writes, you remind them of that. Every word that Paul writes is Scripture. It's from the Lord Jesus in glory instead of on the dusty roads of the land of Israel. All right, so back to Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> Paul is using Abraham as the epitome of faith alone. Verse 3 again of Romans 4. For what saith the Scripture, the Word of God? Abraham believed God. He took God at His Word. He wasn't just believing in Him and making recognition that He's out there someplace. He believed what He said. All right? And it, His believing, His faith, Faith plus nothing was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now, I think I told in the last taping, I've had people just come right back at me, even in my same audience, and say to the audience, no, it's not by faith alone. James says it's faith plus works. Okay, let's go back and see where they're looking at. And they say it with such authority. And I say with such ignorance. <laughs> well, that's not an unkind word. I'm not making any reflection on their mental ability. I'm making a reflection on what they've been taught. That's ignorance. When you haven't been taught something, you're ignorant. I'm ready to admit, I'm ignorant of a lot of things in this world. Look at the light above us. I'm ignorant of electricity. I'm ignorant of a lot of things. That's nothing to be ashamed of. It's just that I haven't been taught. All right, now same way when these people say that Abraham was saved by his works, they're ignorant of the very fact that they haven't been taught. Now look what James says in James chapter 2, verse 21, and I have to smile when I read it. I can't help it. Was not Abraham our father, father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now wait a minute. Think. Think. Is that when Abraham got his salvation? When he offered Isaac? No, it was years before. Isaac is already, what, 17, 18 years old? Abraham became a believer before even Ishmael was born. He was a believer 18 years before he offered Isaac. How can James say that this was an indication of Abraham's work salvation? Well, the very next verse, 22, the first word tells it all. What is it? Seest. Seest with your eyes. All right, now let's look a minute. When Abraham believed God, 
and he left Ur, did the general population see his saving faith? No. No. But when they were told or had witnessed him ready to give his son Isaac because of his faith, now what were they seeing? His works. Did I get that across? God looks on the heart. He doesn't need a work to see our faith. But our fellow mankind, yes, they have to see a work, a result of our salvation to know that we're saved. See, and that's where James is coming at. James is a legalist. James is still under the law. And so he's a faith works writer. And so that's his emphasis. Don't you see what Abraham did? And then you come down. Well, let's just read it. This is interesting. Scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now verse 24. You see then... Now, what does he mean by that word see? With the eyes, by understanding, we can see that his works was a manifestation of his faith. Now, let's again be commonsensical. Do you think the man Abraham would have ever offered that 18-year-old son upon an altar if he was not a man of faith? Never. But how did he manifest his faith? Oh, let's see if I can find it. I didn't prepare for this, so bear with me as I look. I think it's got to be Genesis 22, 23, somewhere's in here, so we'll find it. 22. Genesis 22. <clears throat> now, if this doesn't show the man's faith, which had already been operating for 18 or 20 years, I don't know what does. All right, Genesis 22, and let's see, honey, we're going to drop down to verse 5. Genesis 22, we'll jump in at verse 5. Oh, this is interesting. I hope you're having as much fun with this as I am. And Abraham said unto his young men, that were traveling with him. Now, you want to remember the background. They were down in southern Israel, what's now the Negev, down in Beersheba, and they're making their way up to Mount Moriah, which is probably the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. All right, so he and Isaac have some help meet men with them to carry the wood and so on and so forth. All right, so verse 5, Abraham said to his young men, his servants, <clears throat> Abide ye here with the ass, the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood, the bird offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father, and he said, Father, he said, Here am I. Behold the fire and the wood. Where's the offering? Boy, now you talk about innocence, <laughs> right? The poor lad had no idea what the father was intending to do. All right? Now verse 8. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now what did Abraham know? That even if he did kill the lad, God would resurrect him in time to walk back to those servants waiting by the donkey. He knew that. How did he know? By faith. By faith. And that's why Abraham is such an epitome of faith in Scripture. That's why Paul uses him. He knew. He knew that he wouldn't have to leave Isaac behind dead. And so he had no compunction about raising the knife. All right, now come back to Romans chapter 4, if you will, and we'll keep moving on. <clears throat> now verse 4. We're still leading up to the but. That's the crux of our lesson. 
Now to him that worketh, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt or works. Now you got that? To him who works, the reward isn't by God's grace. It isn't poured out in God's mercy. He's going to get to the place where he can say, God, you owe it to me. You've got to let me into your heaven because I've worked my way. Foolishness, isn't it? As ridiculous as you can get. And yet that's the mass of Christendom. The only, the only temper they put on it is, well, maybe if I haven't done enough, I'll go the other direction. But they don't really believe that's going to happen. They still think that they're going to get to the pearly gates and God's going to let them in. No, he won't. All right, now we come to our verse. But, not to him that worketh, but to him that worketh not. That's a tough pill to swallow, isn't it? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him who justifies what kind of people? The ungodly. Now, even in Christ's earthly ministry, did the righteous ever come to salvation? No. He made the example. Do healthy people need a doctor? No. No, we like to stay as far away from those guys as we can. But when we're sick, yes, we need one. Okay, now we've used this not too many weeks ago, but I, I love this and so much I've got to use it again. Luke 15. Luke 15. The hundred sheep and the lost lamb. As soon as I read it, I think your memory will be shaken up. Luke 15, start in verse 4, honey. <coughs> Luke 15, verse 4. If you have a red letter edition, it's in red. It's the Lord speaking. And he spoke this parable, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine, not in the fold, the way the hymn writer put it. Remember that old hymn? There were ninety and nine that safely lay. In the shelter of the fold? Uh-uh. They're not in the fold. They're out in the desert. And you have to be there. I'll, I guess my best picture of the desert, honey, is when we went from Amman, Jordan, to Petra. Remember? It? Weren't you along that time? No? Who was along to Petra? Anybody in here? Yeah, Rocky, you were. You remember that? That long bus ride from Amman to Petra, just as flat as this floor, and nothing on it but sand and gravel and camels. What those camels ate, I'll never know. But that was the desert, as we have pictured in Scripture. That's the wilderness. All right. So he leaves the ninety and nine sheep, and with all the sparse little pizza grass, they just keep moving. They keep moving. And I think most of you have read enough about sheep. They're as dumb as the rock under their feet. So what do they do? They just go out all 99 different directions. And in short order, every one of them are what? They're lost. They don't know where they are. But anyway, the parable doesn't deal with that part. It's dealing with the one who knows he's lost. He's caught someplace, maybe in a thicket, and he's just bleeding his little head off. And so the shepherd goes and finds that which is lost, until he find it. But here's the crux of why I came back here. And when he found it, he lay on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he came home, he called together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep was which was lost, the one and only. Now let's pick up the 99 in the next verse. I likewise say unto you, there will be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. 
So what were those 90 and 9? Lost. Lost. Why? Because they saw no need. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm okay. Hard to take, isn't it? But see, that's the human race today. They see no need for salvation. I'm all right. I'm not any worse than the next guy. I'm just as good as my neighbor. And that's what they compare themselves to. But listen, they're as lost as these 99 sheep who were self-righteous. They had no need for repentance. All right, now then, you come back to Romans chapter 4. This is the total opposite of that scenario. To him who worketh not, but places his faith and believes the word of the one who justifies the ungodly. See, God can't save the righteous person because the righteous person says, I don't need salvation. I'm okay. Do you see that? And so as I've said, over the years I've been teaching, you can't step into salvation until you know that you're lost. That's the first step. And then that lost person can suddenly realize, yes, he did it all. There's nothing I can do. And so he is placing his face in the one who justifies the ungodly. Consequently, that lost person's faith, not his works, his faith is counted for what? Righteousness. Now again, I say it over and over. I can't comprehend all that. I don't think any human being can. How that the creator, God of the universe, can look at that ungodly individual and save him the moment he puts his faith in the gospel. But that's what the book teaches. But we also have to realize that when that ungodly person becomes a believer, he's going to be a changed individual. He's not going to continue in his ways of the world. He's going to become a member of the body of Christ. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries. 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.